Wagwan, you multifamily enthusiasts. Welcome to another episode of the Multifamily Real Estate Experiment Podcast. I'm your host, Shalon Hutchison, and you in real estate might know me as Hutch the Marine Investor. Today, we have an exciting guest for you. Um, Matt Pacheni is a real estate investor and author. He's also an advocate for financial freedom. He's a coach. He's a Tony Award winner. He has a number one best-selling book, Backstage Guide to Real Estate. He is focused on developing passive income stream that enable investors to write their own story and choose how they want to spend their time. Look, this is important because society have given us a paradigm, a way to think about money and a way to understand financing that might not be in our best interest to create the best financial trajectory for ourselves. So we're going to dive into these topics today. And I know for sure that Matt is going to give us some new, fresh insight to help us see money in a new light. So I want to welcome you to this episode, Matt Pacini. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, Hush, thanks so much for having me as a guest on your show. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. So Matt, today we're going to ask the question, we're going to bust the myth of mortgage and we're going to ask the question why financial freedom is better than being debt free but before we get into that matt do you have a favorite real estate quote or mantra that drives you i just try to make everything a win-win yeah. kind of my mantra i try to make things good for everybody involved in anything that i get involved with so with the real estate projects I want to make sure that we're doing things that are good for the residents of the property. I want to make sure things that are good for the staff and also good for us as investors. We have a profit motive here, not a charity. We do want to make money, but I think that we right. can do that and be ethical. And so that's yes. something that's really important to me. Yeah. And I like that because Napoleon Hill talks about not going into any business venture that is not mutually beneficial. I want to just really talk about it. I took my son to the best ever conference back in 20, I want to say 2021, I think it was, or 2022. This is right before he head off, he head off to college. And we are among some very successful real estate folks. And this was his first experience in an environment where there was a lot of successful people, but also there was such a positive energy in that environment, right? Where everyone was being aspiring to be the, the best representation of themselves, their family name, and the, the, their business. And he asked me the question, can you be a successful person and an ethical person at the same time? And that really got me thinking of the importance of being in this environment and the, the way we share our knowledge, the, the way we partner with people so we all can level up, right? Rising tides raise all shit. That's one of the beautiful things I like about real estate and investing. To your point about creating win-win situation is definitely a good thing that we do here in real estate. For our listeners who might not be familiar with your work, could you give us a brief overview of your background and how you got into real estate investing? Yeah, I moved to New York City. I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I moved to okay. New York City to pursue a career in theater. I was a professional actor for many years. Then came the mid-90s and the big dot-com craze. And instead of waiting on tables at the Hard Rock Cafe in between my acting jobs, I actually started doing some coding. I taught myself how to code HTML, uh, and that grew. And there was so much work. I, I started my own boutique agency. Things were going great until 2001. The dot-com bubble burst, and my business completely failed. And... At that exact time, I got a phone call from my landlord who told me I had 90 days to get out of the apartment I was living in. I found a new job. I actually went in-house at Showtime, who had been a client of mine, the cable television channel. And instead of finding another place to rent, I found a place to buy. So I bought a place up in Washington Heights. A little over two years later, I sold that place and saw my initial investment, my down payment in that property, more than quadruple in value. And that wow. was like a huge light bulb moment for me. This was back in 2003. I was making six figures, which was good money back then. Yeah. In that one transaction, I made more than an entire year's worth of salary. Ooh. So I wanted to figure out how can I do that again? How do I make real estate something that I could do more? 
I spent about 15 years trying to figure that out. How do I replicate that? Uh, single family homes. I did a house hack. I flipped some properties, did some longer term rentals, short term rentals. But then I found out about real estate syndication in 2016. I haven't really looked back since then. I've been focused on multifamily syndications, mainly in the Sun Belt. At this point, I have over 4,500 units as a general partner. So over $650 million worth of real estate that I fractional ownership of and that I operate. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a lot of investments as a passive investor as well. So like in total, a little bit more than half of that is a limited partner. Yeah, that is an amazing journey, Matt. And I think you are the person to talk about, but also who better to talk about these kind of financial freedom strategy than the person who wrote the book. Today, what I want to capture in 30 minutes or so is I want to ask some question on, on the following topic, right? I want to talk about the myth of mortgage, financial freedom versus debt-free, good debt versus bad debt, leveraging debt for financial growth, some risk management, some psychology aspect, building wealth through real estate. And the, the, then we might get into some case study and we open with the, to take away some actionable advice from this podcast episode. All right. So many people believe that being debt free is the ultimate financial goal. Can you explain why this might not always be the best approach, especially when it comes to mortgages? Yeah, this is something that I've talked with individual people about. It's actually eye-opening for me when I figured it out. And I ended up writing an article that was published in Forbes magazine yeah. about this particular topic. It was very popular. And I actually made a video of it on my YouTube channel. It is by far the most popular and controversial video that I have with like lots of comments about people agreeing and yeah. people disagreeing with the concept. And so it's something that can be controversial and really make people think. I tell a story a little bit about this in my book, Backstage Guide to Real Estate, where I talk about an investor who lived, when I was living in the Boston area, lived nearby, I had met him, and he was in the same mindset of pay off the mortgage, right? Pay off all the mortgages. He had recently refinanced his properties into a 15-year mortgage, portfolio mortgage. He owned uh, about seven or eight of these very, is a very high end area. And they were all duplexes. Right. And we're talking about duplexes that cost two to $3 million, very affluent part of the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. The, the thing is, this guy was going to need to work his butt off for the next 15 years to pay off that mortgage and have, he wasn't going to have any cash flow, right? All the money was going back into the properties and he was still going to need to work his job. And he had a job as a real estate appraiser and he enjoyed his job, but yeah. he was going to have to continue to work that job for the next 15 years. After those 15 years, though, all those pr properties would be paid off and the cash flow would be incredible, right? But my point to him was, okay, what, what if something happens to you in the next 15 years? The guy was almost 50 years old. I said, listen, you want to go, you yeah. want to travel, you want to enjoy your life at 50. Right now, you're able-bodied and you're able to go around and visit, but what happens when you're 65? Are you going to be able to do the same kinds of things? And instead of working your fingers to the bone, I said, you can do this in 30 years, still pay off your mortgage, but you would have cash flow coming in every month. You can use that money to go on fabulous vacations or invest that money in something else. Remember, this was a few years ago when interest rates were historically low. He right. could have put everything into 30 year at 3%, maybe 4% interest rate. Not like today where rates are seven, 8%, just depending on things. So I said, go ahead, get the mortgages at 3%, 4%. And even if you just take that money that keeps coming in and you invest that money into something else, you would make arbitrage. You would have uh, mm -hmm. a what's it's actually technically called positive carry. The difference between the interest you're getting on the investments that you have and the interest that you're paying. I mean, if you would have done that back then at let's say three percent, you can put money in the bank right now in a CD and get five percent. You'd be making a two percent carried. I go into detail in the numbers on the video and in the Forbes article, but basically. 
I, I did a scenario where you buy a property and you pay it off over 15 years or over 30 years. This person's argument, the other investor's argument was, Matt, the thing that I can't stomach is the fact that I'm going to be paying 15 more years of interest to the bank, right? right. And that ends up being, I don't remember what the number was, but maybe let's just call it a million dollars more interest over the life of the loan. But when you do the math and you look at it, I did a thing where, okay, let's say you borrowed it at 5% and you invested in something that was giving you an 8% return. Even the stock market average is higher than that. If you just took the money, you have to be disciplined to do it, right? You can't yes. just blow the money. But if you take that money, you were to actually invest it and let that interest compound over time, you would make three quarters of a million dollars. Like you'd be so far ahead and it just makes a lot of sense. There are other reasons why you might want to do that too when it comes to asset protection strategies because if you own a property free and clear especially if it's a rental but even if it is your primary residence and for some reason someone we're going to try to sue and get at that asset and i'm not an attorney here you should talk with asset protection attorneys but if someone will try to sue and get that asset you would be defending yourself where if a bank owns 75% of the property, the bank's probably going to help you out to some extent and try to help make sure that property, that they don't lose all of their equity in a property. So there are other reasons, but from a philosophical standpoint, it's just a question of like, how do you want to live? Right. Do you want to work your fingers to the bone for that time in the future, right? And then you'll be on easy street, which could happen. But life happens. We never know when something's going to happen that's going to leave us disabled or killed, quite frankly. Yeah. And those things do happen, not very often, but they do happen. And so I would rather enjoy my life now. I'll say this, though. You have to be very careful with the way that you do it. And you have to be very responsible. I'm not somebody who is like... This like YOLO, go for broke. I've never do dove out of an airplane. I've never skydived. I never will. So I, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think it has to be to an extreme. But I do think you can prudently leverage your property, have reasonable payments. You know, I'm not talking about leveraging your property with a 100% loan that's, only in, that's interest only kind of thing, because that's ridiculous. But you could have a 60, 70, 75% loan on a property, uh -huh. make reasonable payments, make sure you know that you can make those payments, but pay a little bit less than if you were trying to pay it off over 15 years. I think it's a smart way to go about things and it also gives you money to do things with. If you have a property that's completely paid off and that property appreciates, let's say 3% a year, and let's say you have, you know, a property that's worth a million dollars. Okay. So you've got that 3% of appreciation. So what is that? $3,000? No, sorry. $30,000 every year, which is nice, right? But the question is, what if you were to take that property and buy another property? Let's say you take out a, a cash out refinance, which by the way, is not considered income. Right. Because you're not getting income, you're getting another loan. Uh -huh. And you take that million dollar property that you have paid off and you take $500,000 off. And then you use that $500,000 to buy another million dollar property. So now you have $2 million properties, both of them at only 50% leverage, right? And now both of them are going up at 3%. So instead of $30,000 on one, now you're making $60,000 a year in appreciation. That's just one example of the way that leverage done conservatively, approaching it pragmatically, can help you build wealth beyond what you could if you just paid off your property. Going back to that scenario real quick, let's say you lived in a property and it was completely paid off and it's yeah. a million dollar property. How are you going to have money to feed yourself and clothe yourself and maybe a spouse and maybe children, right? If you don't have anything else, but you've paid off your property, so you have no debt, great, but you're still going to need to work a job to have that right. income. Yep. Where if you did this exact same scenario that we talked about, where you now have the one property and then you rent out another property, 
you have income coming from that other property. As long as it's underwritten properly mm -hmm. and it's a good deal, you can be in a situation where, yeah, you have a mortgage payment that you're making. However, you're making enough income to cover that mortgage plus pay for clothes, food, and things of that nature. Would you rather be debt free, but still have to work and make money? Or would you rather be financially free where you don't have to work, but you have some debt, but it's responsible debt? Yeah, that's a, a neat segue into what the next question is, is going to be, right? You know, so before we get into that, though, man, one of the things that I like, and I didn't coin this mantra, I got it from Grant Cardone. He pushed a lot of information out that is really thought provoking, that helps people to elevate their life, right? The 10X concept. Yeah. One of his mantra that he talks about, he said that I have no debt other than debt that's been paid for by others, right? Mm -hmm. So to the point where you're buying income producing asset, I learned that a phrase recently too, that was very useful. And I think our listeners would like this one. It says, borrow debt long-term at low interest rate and buy income producing asset, right? So I think those two mantras married up and get a deep understanding and then create a financial strategy, a long-term financial strategy around that idea will definitely help us to, to one, get a better understanding of what we're trying to do at a predetermined time, and then do the things to get there to ensure that we're not relying on our own effort to create an income, and also that we're not just having equity that is not providing us income. So along the way, our financial journey, we are creating income streams. So thank you for busting the myth about mortgages. What I want to talk about in the next question is, how do you define financial freedom, and how does it differ from the concept of being debt-free? Yeah, I think that financial freedom is when you have the ability to not have to work, right? You don't have to work for your money. You don't have to trade time for money, yeah. but you have assets that are producing income for you. Right. And being debt-free doesn't necessarily provide that. Being debt free, you, you were talking about Cardone, who who's a great thought leader. We could also talk about Robert Kiyosaki, right, who yeah. really changed my mindset when I first found out that he says that owning a home is actually a liability and not an asset. I had heard that and I disagreed with it vehemently and I had never read his book. And then I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was <laughs> so crazy <we're> right. too. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I was like, of course, it's an asset. Everyone tells me it's an <laughs> asset, but it is a liability. And so how do you, but you can convert that liability to an asset. And just like you're saying, by being able to use your money to invest in properties or other things that produce income for you, you can get to a point where you have so much income coming in that covers your debt and hopefully you've done a smart job with your debt and you have, like you were saying, fixed rate, long-term, low interest rate, hopefully. It doesn't even matter what the interest rate is, honestly, as long as the numbers make sense for a long-term. Once you have enough of those, you get to a point where you are financially free, but you have debt. But I'd rather be financially free than debt-free. Yeah, and I totally agree with you, man. But that comes with a lot of us relearning the way money works and a paradigm that was created for us, right? Because I'm a firm believer that the people that care the most about us, that, that's been a part of our life, right? They, they did the best they could with the information that they had at the time. You're right, Hutch. Everybody yeah. was taught, right? You go to school, you get a good job, you work at a job for 50 years, you pay off your home, right? That's what our parents were taught. Yeah. And that's what they taught us. But that's not really the way to gain wealth. Yeah. So we all are aware that not everyone wants to create wealth, right? But for the people who take the time to listen to these podcasts, they might be looking for a different way to think about money or a better way to think about money and might be aspiring to create wealth. Because look, it's really not a bad thing to go into retirement and having no debt, especially if you for fortunate to retire in an environment where social security available to you, 
or you retire from the military where you're going to get a retirement check or you have retired from the military and then you go into another retirement where you're not going to have roughly two checks coming in and you're debt free. And that is the life you want to live, right? But is it a smaller group of people who are looking to create something that will transcend their lifetime, which we talk about that generational wealth, which going to be, which is going to require a little bit more effort towards building that generational wealth to each their own. You have over 10,000 units within your portfolio, which is active and passive investing. Now, I want to talk about leveraging debt for financial growth in the form of syndication. How can leveraging debt such as mortgage help in achieving financial growth and freedom? Can you share personal experience or example where this strategy works for you and your investors? Sure. And and just to to add on a little bit to what you're saying before, I think creating wealth is important and and wealth to one person can mean something very different to somebody else. I'm not talking about having z- gazillions <laughs> of dollars, but okay. I am talking about having money to be able to support yourself and your family. Uh, I think that pensions and retirement and social security and things like that are all wonderful. However, there's talks about maybe getting rid of social security or that social security right. may be insolvent. And this is not to have a political com. I don't want to have a political conversation about that. <laughs> but, but if it were to go away or if somehow, and first off, thank you, Hodge, for your service to our country and to anybody else who's listening, who's either active or former, I, I owe the debt of gratitude to you, but and maybe that could get cut in the future. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. So to put yourself in a position where if something, God forbid, were to happen to that, you would still be okay. And just putting yourself in the best possible financial situation that you could. So when it comes to syndication, syndications have been wonderful for me. I've invested both from a passive perspective and also from an active perspective, as a general partner, I have deals that I lead and bring investors in on my deals, or I go on other people's deals as just a, a passive investor. Leverage is a multiplier. It is, um, yeah. And, but like in the Spider-Man movie, they said, with great power comes great responsibility. And leverage is a magnifying glass, but it doesn't just magnify uh, gains. It also can magnify losses, So you have to be very careful about how you use your leverage. I've never done a real estate deal where we haven't had some version of a mortgage. I've had mortgages as low, we've done leverage as low as 60% on some of our deals and as high as 80% on some of our deals. But it usually ranges around the 70 to 75% of leverage. And that allows us to have a deal where the numbers make sense. Without that leverage, if we were to buy a property all cash, the returns would not be as strong. Right. We need more cash to be in the deal. Also, our returns, our tax benefits wouldn't be as strong either. We utilize depreciation on our assets. And depreciation is where there's some wear and tear on the property over time. The IRS lets us remove a certain amount of value from the property as a loss each year. And there are ways that you can accelerate that to let some of it come in the earlier years. With the 2017 Jobs Act, there was a thing called bonus depreciation, which had been around developers, but it was only for new construction. And it, it started to be available for every property at 100%. It's currently sunsetting. There's talks that it's going to come back, um, but it allows you to take anything that depreciates in 20 years or less and accelerate that all up into the first year. The interesting thing about it is with 100% bonus depreciation, you could potentially invest $100,000, let's say, just as a round number into a syndication and have a loss. This is a real life example. I had $100,000 that I invested in a syndication and I got a K-1 at the end of the year, the tax document that shows how the property performed and what income I have to pay taxes on. And I had a loss of (laughs) $110,000. I had $100,000 I had put into the deal. 
I had gotten about $5,000 in distributions because this it, we didn't start at the beginning of the year. This was our first year in, but I had $110,000 loss. Mm -hmm. And someone might wonder, how is that possible? Like, how could your loss be more than what you actually invested? And the reason why is depreciation works on the value of the entire property, regardless of how you finance that property. So we finance our properties through what we call our capital stack, which is debt, which is the mortgage, and then equity, which is the investors. Right. So if we have, let's say, a million dollar property and we had a seven million dollar loan, but we had three million dollars of equity into the deal, we're still depreciating not just the three million dollars of equity, but the full 10 million. Yeah. Um, when we do these cost segregation studies, which is a, a study done by a, a qualified engineer that actually takes a look at everything on the property and puts it into the IRS to find class lives. And we have to do that in order to accelerate depreciation or to use bonus depreciation. So we get this study done by, by a qualified engineer. They usually find about 15 to 20% of the property that can be accelerated into the first year through bonus depreciation. But think about it. If we have, let's say, 80% leverage on the property, but let's say the cost segregation study comes out and 21% of that property is actually able to be depreciated, right. you're actually depreciating more than what your equity in the deal is. <laughs> yeah, if you buy a, a property all cash, now you need to double the entire value of the property. For example, that $10 million property, right? If you buy it for $10 million cash, plus all the fees and stuff that you need to pay, pay for different things, then you need to double the value of that property. Now, if you have leverage on a property, say 70%, and you have equity of 30%, you just need to increase the value of the property overall through operation, whether you are in improving it through operation efficiency or you're doing some force appreciation by renovating some units and charging more for rental income. So you just need to improve the value of the property, maybe 30, 40%, and you get to double that equity, the equity in the property. In actuality, you you have now doubled your money that you put into the property. And so you have a shorter time horizon and the velocity of your capital can in in increase. Now, every time you sell that property three to five years, then that doesn't always trigger a, a taxable event, right? Because you can also roll it over into a 1031 exchange, which is a whole different conversation that we have in real estate. Having debt on a property allows you to buy more with less of your own money, but also creates a, a higher velocity of capital, especially with our real estate syndication model of exiting the property from three to seven years after purchase. Thank you for breaking that down for us, Matt. We touched on risk a little bit, but let's dive more into risk management. You know, so while leveraging debt can lead to financial growth, it also comes with risk. What are some of the risks? What are some of the key risk management strategy you recommend for investors while using debt to build their portfolio? Let's narrow that down on the real estate syndication pro um, concept as well. Yeah, as a limited partner, right in a real estate deal. You don't have that much risk involved from a mortgage perspective. You do put all of your monies at risk. Don't get me wrong. If Correct. you invest $100,000, you could lose that $100,000, but nothing beyond that because you're a limited partner. Where the right. general partners, there's the, uh, oftentimes recourse and other types of guarantees that are in place where the banks can come after the general partners. So they have to be very careful but the fact is that when you do have a bank, I think it may even make deals less risky when you have a mortgage on them because the the banks aren't just going to give you a mortgage, right? That it's sometimes very difficult to get a mortgage on a property. They want to make sure that the people who are running the deal have experience. They also want to make sure that they underwrite the deal under their own metrics. And a lot of times they want to see uh, a what's called a DSCR, which is a, the debt service coverage ratio. They want to see that a lot of times at a minimum of 1.25. So what that means is let's assume that your mortgage payment, 
we're buying these very large properties. Let's say your mortgage payment is $100,000 a month, okay? They are going to want to see that the income that you should be getting off the property is going to be 125. See, that's the 1.25% of that debt service is what, what's going to be coming in. After so that, all expenses. After all expenses, Correct. right? Yeah. So that they know that, hey, look, if something happens and the income goes down, the occupancy goes down, there's still the 25% there of extra money that should be coming in from the property of profit more than what it's going to cost to to service the mortgage, to make the right. mortgage payment. And so that also is helpful because I think that there are people out there who are newer at the game and don't know that, who are, don't know how to run the numbers correctly and could get themselves in a bad position. So I do think that having a lender there who's going to review it and all, they want to make sure that their money is going to be safe Right. And that they're going to be able to get it back. So it can help. But you obviously need to be very careful with how you're doing these things. Make sure that you're well-educated, that you have experienced people on your team, that you have a good team of advisors around you to make sure that you're getting into deals that have the greatest chance of success. That That's great, man. And a lot of folks got into some hot waters in, in the not so distant past where we we had this imagination of what the future is going to be because we were in a low interest rate environment. So to a passive investor who was listening to this episode, it's really important that you understand the debt that these operators are taking on the assets. So even though in most cases for more predictability, you want to see fixed rate debt, there are operators who are still doing adjustable rate mortgage to accomplish the business plan that they have established. And it's really important to ask those hard questions to get a deep understanding of why they would choose an adjustable rate mortgage in these times, because it, it really matters um, for the type of projects that you're doing. If you're doing something that has a huge value add component, you are actually increasing the value of the property significantly versus a stabilized property. It's really important that you ask those questions and get a deep understanding of the thought process or the analysis and projection behind the different type of debt that are available and what risk we're accepting with the debt. Thank you, Matt, for diving into that. We touched on a couple of these, building wealth through real estate. We talk about the psychology you mentioned. I talk about Grant Cardone. You mentioned rich dad, poor dad. And I think you also mentioned some case study. I think we, we covered a lot in this podcast that would help our listeners to understand, like really to each their own. Your journey is your journey, but it's important to understand where you are the, the paradigm that was created for you. And from that place, identify the quality of feature that you want to create and start doing the necessary research, reading book, like the backstage guide to real estate that will give you some fresh ideas of the way to look at real estate, right? So one of the things that I tell every veteran that is using the VA loan to purchase an asset, we need to look at every piece of real estate as an investment. And the reason being, if you're a young guy or gal listening to this, you recently joined the military and you are able to leverage the VA loan in a home that you either live or intend to occupy, it's important that you run the numbers and understand that whenever you depart from that duty station, whether it's to EAS and go back home, right? Or you're going to move, you're going to PCS, permanent ch um, ch change of station to another location. It's important for you to understand what's going to be your exit strategy or your long-term hold strategy, right? So view every single piece of real estate as an investment property and you get the right leverage for the property that gives you sometime infinite return or just the velocity of your in invested capital. So see every piece of real estate as a investment property and do the necessary research to do the best evaluations. So, you know, so Matt, I want to thank you for joining us on this podcast episode. And I want to go into what we what I call the focus round. This is five questions that we're going to breeze through. What do you do for fun, Matt? I hang out with my kids. What is one opportunity that was a game changer for you? Being on this podcast. <laughs> what is your number one communication tip? Oh, I just think building relationships and fostering relationships is really important. And the yeah. best way to do that is by figuring out how you can help people. What do people need and how can you help them? What is one thing you wish you understood earlier? 
I wish I understood leverage better. <laughs> to what do you attribute your success? What would I attribute my success to? I think persistence. I've been somebody who makes sure that I keep going no matter what. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's two words I'm trying to make very popular. stick to itiveness and figure outable. Figure out. <laughs> yes, sir. So Matt, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? I think and the also- best way is to go to pichenny.com, P-I-C-H-E-N-Y.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I've got a bunch of free videos and resources at the bottom of the website. On every page, there's all my socials and my YouTube channel and everything there. So go to pichenny.com. It's P-I-C-H-E-N-Y.com. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us with this podcast. I trust yeah. that this interview was a good value of your time. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. So listeners, I want to thank you again for listening to another episode of the multifamily real estate experiment podcast. It's definitely truly an honor that you spend your time with us. So I want to ask you this one thing. If you like the value that this podcast is providing you, provide us some, some good value comments, honest feedback on these podcast episode. Maybe tell us something we can do better and also give us a five-star rating. That'd be great. <laughs> but I want to thank you for listening to another episode of this podcast. I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. Happy investing. Out. <laughs>